Hello, welcome back to The Wire Podcast. I am your host, Ryan McCrary, and today I have a great episode for y'all. To start off the podcast, I have an interview with Dale Brown, former LSU basketball coach who coached Shaquille O'Neal, Chris Jackson, now known as Madhul Abdul Rauf. Um, he changed his name after converting Islam. So I got that interview that I did today. And then we're going to talk about college football players opting out of this year's season. And then we're going to talk about the NBA. We got some interesting storylines to get to. But without further ado, here is the interview with Dale Brown. For anyone who doesn't know, you are you were a the head coach at LSU um, in the 80s and the 90s. You started your coaching career at Columbus High School in Dakota. Did you always want to be a basketball coach? No, not really. I didn't. Uh, in fact, I started, actually, I spent three decades at LSU. I started in the 70s. I um, really wasn't interested. I went to college to play sports, to be honest with you. No one in my, nobody in my family had ever been to college. or uh, My mother had an eighth grade education and had no father. He abandoned us before I was even born, two days before I was born. So going to college, I went really for sports, but then I got really stimulated in college by a history professor, and I I just had a quest for learning for the first time, really. I really didn't study up until then, and from that day on, I became a voracious reader, uh, but still hadn't made up my mind what I was going to do. In fact, what I really wanted to do was I wanted to be an FBI agent and head up the FBI someday, but I went to a teacher's college. And at that time, you either had to have a uh, degree in accounting or a, a, a law degree in order to be a FBI. So since it was a teacher's college, I accepted that job in, up on the Canadian-Montana border in a small town called Columbus. And I fell in love with coaching instantly and coached 44 years. Yeah, so you, you coach multiple sports um, at Columbus. Like you coach. I believe they coached wrestling and track as well, right? Oh, man. Yeah. I coached him. What, what I did, I was a head basketball coach, head wrestling coach, head track coach, taught five subjects, and I was a high school principal. And I thought I was making a killing, Ryan. Got <laughs> $4,700 a year. I thought, well, oh, I'm living yeah. high off the hog. That's funny. Uh, was basketball your favorite sport to coach, or did you, did you um, like, like? Yes, basketball was my favorite sport. Baseball was my second favorite sport. But I might have been the worst hitter in the history of junior age in baseball. And I grew up at that time in the eastern part of the state. One of our competitors was Roger Maris, who went on and broke Babe Ruth's record. And uh, for some reason, I don't know why, I could not hit a ball. <laughs> I'd stand up the plate and try to get hit. I didn't strike out, but I was always hitting to somebody. So basketball always was my favorite sport, yes. Yeah, did, you, did you play in college? Yes, I played at Minot State University and um, played football, basketball, and track and field. And I was fortunate enough because at that time, they, they were what you call quarters. They now have semesters. But you only got your scholarship for each particular quarter you were involved in in a sport. So because, that wasn't the stimulant for me. One, I, I liked them all, but I did wind up getting twelve letters in those three sports. Yeah. So uh, you coached high school basketball for a while, um, and you ended up being an assistant coach at Utah State and Washington State, and you got the job as a head coach, the head basketball coach at LSU. Were you getting any interest from other schools? Um, yes, I had just been offered, uh, just prior to that, I was offered the head job at Washington State University and uh, turned that down to uh, take the LSU job. Well, that ended up being a pretty good decision. LSU was really, really good during your tenure. Um, when you first got there, LSU was not very good, uh, but in your first year, Y'all finished 14 and 10, and 9 and 9 in the SEC, and you won SEC Coach of the Year. How were you able to turn LSU into a winning team when they had only four winning seasons in 18 years before you got there? Ryan, you're doing your homework, you rascal. 
um, it was not easy. It was like pulling teeth. It was a football school. Right. Everything revolved around football, all the interest. That was really, even within the athletic department, outside the man that hired me, the athletic director, most of them were kind of blase and bland about it, really didn't care if we won or lost, I don't think. So it wasn't easy. And then the other the other hurdle I faced, LSU was the last bastion of racism in recruiting athletes. All all the other schools, when well, I say all the other schools, I don't have that as a fact, but most of the other schools all had black athletes. Well, LSU only had one in the history of the school. They wouldn't recruit black athletes. In fact, Elvin Hayes is a good friend of mine who's from Rayville, Louisiana, one of the great college players and NBA players of all time, told me that LSU didn't have any contact with him. He he wrote him a letter and told him he wants to come to LSU, and they still didn't contact him. So wow. when you, when you would go visit to an African-American home. The father and mother would be nice oh, and would say, well, you know, we really appreciate you coming, but the dad would say, Coach, um, I tried to go to LSU, and they didn't even want to recruit me, so we're going to send our son to another school. So I said, I fully understand. I didn't argue with him. I didn't try to persuade him. I said, just you know this. I said, now, I know your son won't be coming to LSU, but remember this. That's my goal. I'm going to recruit human beings first and basketball players second. What your religion, color, financial status is, ethnic background is meaningless to me. So it took some time to break that door down. And one of the magic things, first black All-American in the history of LSU basketball was from Louisville, Kentucky, Rudy Macklin, who was heavily recruited by Kentucky and Louisville. And when he chose to come here, it opened up the floodgates, so to speak, Ryan. Other African-American players, hey, Rudy Macklin went there. Something must be happening, and it did. Um, we beat Kentucky more than any anybody in the history, 18 times. Uh, Macklin was, was the catalyst for that to happen. Yeah. Well, um, so LSU struggled in your next three years uh, after you got there. That's uh, correct. You started to gain a reputation as a hard worker as you tried to, you know, promote basketball um, in a in a football hungry state like Louisiana. Former Mitchell State coach Don Langer said that early on in your career at LSU, you would give out nets wherever you saw a basketball goal and introduce yourself as the head basketball coach at LSU. Is that true? It's 100 percent true. What we did, we couldn't get publicity because we weren't winning. So. What I did, I found a company in Korea that produced purple and gold nets. There wasn't any money in the budget, so I had to take it out of my budget, my, my, my home budget, which was 4000 I think $750 if it's accurate, and buy the nets. Then my assistant coach, who happened to be Homer Drew, the Homer Drew, who's in the College Basketball Hall of Fame, the father of Scott and Bryce Drew, um, his wife was a poet, so we got a little plastic sack, put the purple and gold net in there. We put our schedule in there, our business card, and then she wrote a little poem. Please join the Tiger Safari. This is a net from the, uh, from the purple and gold, a sport that will never grow old. LSU basketball wants you to know, and then we told them we want them to know, that we like them to come and watch us. On the weekends, my two assistants... Jack Shallow and Homer Drew, we picked different parts of the state, got in our cars. Anytime we saw an outside basket, we stopped at the house from dogs biting us, chasing us. Um, <laughs> for, for weeks, we went all over the state passing out nets. And then Sports Illustrated picked it up. And, again, that was good publicity for us because we had no publicity. We weren't winning uh, – even though the first year we pulled a miracle, the next three years were tough. And I think that helped. Right. Yeah. Um, where did the nickname the Master Motivator come from? I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure how they got it. I know um, I know one time, maybe it came. I'm, that's a very good question, and no one's ever asked me that. I'm not sure. It might have been there was a game being played that we were a 13-point underdog. And it was at a timeout, and Billy Packer and Al McGuire and Dick Stockton, if memory serves me right, were doing the game in the Superdome. 
and one of them said, um, "I don't, I don't know how it came down. It was late in the game, and they had they had me mic'd in the in the huddle, which you're totally unaware of. Even though you, they ask you if you can wear a mic, you never think you've got it. And when the huddle broke, I think Billy Packer was the one that said that was Billy Graham and sneakers there. He said, and I don't I don't know if that's where they got the master motivator or not. Right. Yeah. Well, I just saw I was doing research and I saw that you had the nickname. Well, you sure motivator. were. And I Do you know my I'm blood type, you rascal. Sir. Do you know my blood type? You got everything else down. No, I don't have that. I didn't look that up. Uh, oh, I Ryan. I can probably I'm find <laughs> You, you you got all the facts perfect though. Uh, in 1979, uh, LSU led by Dwayne Scales and Al Green. You did have a player that was out with injury. I'm forgetting his name, um, but that year y'all went 23 and six, and you faced Michigan State in the NCAA tournament. What was it like facing off against the young Magic Johnson? Um, we were kind of crippled up. Our star player was out. Uh, my other star player, I'd suspended. Uh, the game was. I knew the game we'd have to hold on the first half because we that particular lineup hadn't played together, and we didn't do well at halftime. In fact, we had a they were a double lead on us, but um, second half I think we outscored them, but they still beat us. But I don't think I don't think they would have been able to beat that team. Matthew Johnson would have beaten our team had we had a full lineup. Right. Yeah, he was. Amazing, and they went on to win the title that year. They um, sure did. Yeah, around, around 1985, you became very vocal about your distaste for the NCAA. And me personally, I don't really like the NCAA that much. Do you still feel the way you did today now? Say again, you cut out on me at the end. Um, yeah, around, around 1985, you became very vocal about your distaste for the NCAA. Do you still feel that way today? I feel even stronger, and let me tell you why. An emotion is worthless unless it has some depth to it behind it. Several situations turned me off forever on the NCAA. Let me give those to you. We were at the Alaskan shootout, and I was taking bed check this particular night. One of our players from St. Louis, Mark Elkhorn, was in bed, and he looked sick. He was, his skin was almost jaundice-looking, and he was ill. And I said, what's wrong, Mark? He said, I got a pain in my side so bad. I said, well, then you're not going to play tomorrow. No, no, coach. No, you're not going to play. Well, he didn't play. We got him home. He was loaded with cancer. He had to go back to St. Louis. He was getting treatment at MD Anderson Center. Uh, everything was going fairly well. But I got a call from his mother. And she said, Coach Brown, I'm just embarrassed to call you. But she said, we put our home, home up for a mortgage the second time. And she said, we gotta take, we've got to take Mark back to MD Anderson, and we just don't have the money. But El McGuire has agreed to uh, – he, he he would come up and send his assistant to speak, and if you'd come up and speak, we're going to raise money to, you know, send Mark back. She said, and she said, and one one other request, and I just – I feel terrible asking you this, but, but Mark's three best friends, she said, that they – he really would like to see them before he dies. Could you get them up here? So I said, I'll, I'll, I absolutely they'll get to get them there. So I immediately called the NCA and the, the letters NCA. I don't know if you know what it stands for. I'm going to tell you, Brian. It stands for not caring about athletes. Not caring about athletes. We were at the point where I called the NCA. I found out what the flights were, how much they cost, and a cheap hotel. So I called there and told them that we, we're going to fly in the airplane from the governor gave us free of charge. No, 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 you can't do that. That's page so the, the manual that time is about 500 pages big by that time, which is ridiculous. I've got a little card in my pocket with the Ten Commandments. It's on a three-by-five card, and I can't keep all of those. So I hung up the phone and thought this is a dilemma I'm in now because I'm so vociferous against the NCA. They would love to prove me to be totally counterfeit. So I have to figure out a way that I can get these guys there. Can you still hear me okay? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Okay. Um, we're having trouble on the line just making sure. So I called and found out what it cost. It cost $300 for the hotel and airplane fare, back and forth for each kid. So I closed my blinds, went to the bank, 
got got money out of the bank, put them in an envelope, called each kid in privately, and gave them the money, and told them, "Don't tell, don't tell your other team in that don't want to get any." But I'm breaking an NCAA rule because they wouldn't pay for it. Well, we get up there, and it was a wonderful event. And as I was introduced, I, for some reason, just it was automatic. I said, Mark Elkhorn's three best friends are here. I said, Joe Cacello, will you stand up? Andy Campbell, will you stand up? Jay Brian Bajron, will you stand up? And I said, they're here. Because the NCAA would not allow me to bring them up any other way. I cheated, and I got them their tickets and paid their way, defying that dysfunctional organization. Well, they didn't do anything. Then there's a second opportunity. Years later, maybe seven, eight years later, I recruited a great player, 6'11", from Playa Blanca, Argentina. Came here with his wife and two-year-old daughter, Hernan Montenegro. Could play every position. We were about four games into the season, and I got a call from the doctor's office, and he told me that um, Mrs. Montenegro and her husband are there, and the baby is breached. She's pregnant, and the baby's breached, and i got to get him out. He said, the baby will die, and she could die but they don't have any insurance. What can we do? And I said, Doc, just get it done. Go ahead and do it. So they did it. Well, the operation with no insurance cost $7,500. So what I did, I called the NCAA again and explained the situation. I said, can I, he'll, he'll play in the NBA someday. I said, can I co-sign at the bank so we can get the money? No, you can't. So now I told them twice what it, they've turned me down. So I thought, I've got to do this properly. So a friend of mine, who's a top attorney, Yale graduate, um, also represents musicians, such as, you know, Wynton Marcellus and famous people like that. I called him and I said, I don't want to mess up, because I said, the NCAA would like to nail me. I said, would you come down and sign him to a contract, and then we'll have to declare him ineligible. He came down, signed him to a contract. Next day, we had to declare him ineligible. That's the NCA. The only thing the NCA does good, the only thing they, they've got to be proud of, they've done it from the beginning, they legislate against human dignity and they practice monumental hypocrisy. It's a joke, the NCA. How they've lasted this long, I don't know. Now, for all the good people that worked in the NCA, and I can name you a litany of them, I'm sorry I would not include you into that group, but the total organization is messed up. And uh, they're getting enough pressure now to change, but I would not be surprised if it didn't disband and the big schools would go into another league. I guess you can tell I'm not really fond of the NCAA. Am I giving that away, Brian? Yes, sir. Well, I'm not big on the NCAA either. Um, and those stories are insane. Now, I have an issue with the NCAA because I believe athletes should get compensation for their work. But those stories that you just told me, are crazy. I mean, they, these players have, like, the player was dying, and they wouldn't fly his team, his friends up there. That's insane. I mean, I knew the NCAA was crooked. I didn't know they were that crooked. Well, let, 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 let me let me tell you how, how crooked they are. Because I was vocal, they had a fake four-and-a-half-year investigation in our program, four-and-a-half years trying to dig up stuff that wasn't even there, just as a witch hunt. And so... It's sad that it's gone on so long, and I don't know why, because everybody is calling for it to cease. And uh, Frank DeFord, who's now passed, one of the greatest sports writers of all time, he said the NCA is the largest legal cartel in the world, and that's pretty accurate. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, those stories are insane. I can't, I can't believe, I can't believe that. That's wild. Uh, well, I mean, I, I can believe it because the NCAA is scummy, but, yeah. Um, well, I'm not going to take the whole show, but I can tell you also about their investigations, how they force kids on tape. I've heard them, how they force kids into saying something that's, that's not true to get a school in trouble that they're investigating to look make themselves look good telling him to lose his eligibility if he doesn't say it this way. Right. Concrete evidence of that. But I'll email you a case of that after we hang up today. 
All right, sounds good. I'd love to see it. That's great. This isn't me talking. I've got I've got the evidence. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I'd love to hear from you. All right, moving on. In 1990, LSU had probably the most talented roster of your tenure. Um, that year, the Tigers had Chris Jackson, who is now um, – he goes by a different name because he converted to Islam, um, Mahmoud abdul Rauf. Uh, they had Stanley Roberts, Shaquille O'Neal, um, and Gert Hammock, who all went on to be first-round picks. And you had a chance to win the national championship that year, but lost to Georgia Tech in the second round. How disappointing was it to fall short of your goal, even though you had um, the talent to reach that goal? Well, there were there were two reasons. Number one, I did not do a good enough job with that talented team. I seem to do better with less talent, but that particular talent team, I'll take the blame for that. However, there was a second reason that people overlook. They only played one year together. I, those three guys you just mentioned, two of them were freshmen. Stanley Roberts and Shaquille O'Neal were freshmen. They were in their first year of playing at LSU, and Chris Jackson was a sophomore. So coupled with that, and then three – the star players, none of them, none of those three had were leaders at that time. They were all nice guys, very kind, polite, uh, easy to coach. But they weren't take charge guys on the court. But the main reason, I don't, I think it was, I just didn't do as good a job as I could have done. And then the youthfulness of that team, and the team we lost to, you know, went on to the Final Four, which was in New Orleans. Yeah, well, Georgia Tech was very talented that year. They had Kenny Anderson. And they were a talented roster. They sure were. They were. They were. I think they were picked to win it. By the way. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Y'all started off the season ranked number two. Y'all had some big wins. And y'all beat UNLV, who went on to win the title. Um, that y'all just lost to Georgia Tech. Um, so that, that it was a bit underwhelming or disappointing for the roster that you had. But, yeah, like you said, y'all, y'all were young. Like, Chris Jackson was young. Shaq was a little baby at that point. He hadn't become what he would become. Um, I want to talk about your two star – or the two players on that team that would go on to be very good NBA players, starting off with Chris Jackson. Um, Chris Jackson was ahead of his times in terms of his play style. He was a great shooter. He shot a lot of threes, and he made a lot of shots off the dribble. How did having a good pull-up shooter – why Dixon beside a dominant big and Shaq make your offense better? Um, Chris Jackson was one of the nicest human beings I've ever coached in my life. He uh, He's the leading scorer in the history of college basketball. Today, even, he averaged, you know, he averaged 30.2 points a game. Now, of course, the guy that, the guy that was the leading scorer as a sophomore, junior, and senior, Happened to be another LSU guy by the name of Pete Maravich, but he was he was an outstanding, good person. Uh, was would have been a really a good NBA player and could have been one of the all-time greats. But again, dealt with unfairly, um, not not dealt with properly on the deal where he was praying during flag time. Total injustice there too. Right. Yeah. Um, you should be an FBI agent, man. You got more facts down. <laughs> well, I did. You I don't know my blood type, so you 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 can't you can't be head of the FBI, so you know that. No, I don't. I don't know your personal information, but I do know everything about your time at LSU. Um, now it's time to talk about Shaq. Um, what was he like in the locker room, like off camera? Was he goofy like he is today? Was he what? Was he goofy? Was he silly? Because now he has a bright personality. He's the star of the show wherever he goes. Was he like that at, at his time? Um, he was. You know, he was he, more shy. He he stuttered when he came here, and of course he conquered that and got his doctorate degree. But he's always been. When you look at him, he looks like the Terminator, but he's really Bambi. He loves kids. He loves older people. He loves down and outers. He doesn't need a posse to run with. Just a, a good, good, good human being. And I can tell you one story that best describes him. When I go speak around the country to corporations, they always ask, a lot ask, 
can we open it up to questions afterwards? Oftentimes, this question, tell us about Shaquille. What kind of guy is he? I said, well, you're all going to want a basketball story. When he ripped the rim down, broke the glass, when he scored, when he got 12 blocks, 40-some points, so many rebounds. But that doesn't describe Shaquille O'Neal. Let me tell you what describes Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal is one of the most benevolent human beings I've ever met in my life. Does not blow his horn, does not call the media and tell him to come and check on him. And the final example would be this. I get a telephone call. He was with, with the uh, he was with the Lakers at the time. I get a call from a woman in Indianapolis. She told me she was originally from Baton Rouge. She had a nine-year-old child. It had a cancerous brain tumor, been operated, didn't know if he was going through some tough times. Would he live? Would he not live? Is he in and out of a coma? And she said, I see the Lakers are playing the Pacers here tonight. Now, that was a big game because there's only two teams left that can win the NBA title, the Pacers and the Lakers. So she said, I know this is asking you a lot, but could I give you my cell number? And you have Shaquille call me on my cell and I can hold it to my son's ear. So if he doesn't make it, he could die happy knowing about Shaquille and hearing his voice. I said, well, I can't make you that promise because it is a big game, but I'll call. So I called Shaq. When he's going to do something, he'll say, got your coach. He said, got your coach. So that, that left alone. I never checked with him again or anything. Two years later, I was sitting in a Baton Rouge restaurant, and this lady came up just as we were getting our meal. And she said, I know this is rude to me, but she said, Coach, you probably don't remember me. She said, I called you two years ago. I'm from Indiana. I said, stop. I know exactly who you are. I said, you called regarding your son. She said, yes, I did. And she said, uh, well, she said, I just I just wanted to tell you, she said, uh, I, I want to just meet you. And I said, well, you wanted Shaquille to call. I said, did, did he call? She said, no, Coach Brown, he did not call. I said, he didn't. She said, no, Coach, he didn't. She said, he came to the hospital, and he sat with my son for an hour or more, sang with him, prayed with him, told him jokes, laughed. My son woke up, they talked, and she said, I just want you to know how gracious our family is for what he did. He does that all the time. He didn't get the newspapers to follow him around. He just does it. So basketball is secondary compared to what he does off the court. There's the interview, and thank you so much to Dale Brown for being willing to come on the show and do an interview. It was great. He was amazing, and like I said, I am very thankful to him for that. Let's move on and talk about college football players opting out of the season. It's happened. It's going to continue to happen right now. There's three big, actually four big names that have opted out of the season. We have Rashad Bateman, the receiver from Minnesota. We have Micah Parsons, Penn State linebacker. We have Gregory Rousseau, a Miami defensive end. And then we have Virginia Tech corner, uh, Caleb Fairley. Those four guys have opted out of the season, so they will not be playing this year. Um, It sucks that players are opting out, but I completely understand they have the right to do this. If they feel like or if they are uncomfortable with playing in these conditions, they have the right to do what's best for them. And if fans of college football are going to, you know, talk crap about them on Twitter and criticize them for their decision, they're idiots. Like, I don't know why people are upset about this. Um, Even with the NFL, like a bunch of NFL players have opted out. And people were just going after them on Twitter. Why? Like, if you're in the same situation where you could get paid to not work, you would do the same thing. And, like, it's a pandemic. Guys don't want to spread it to their families. Guys don't want to get it themselves. The virus is real. And, it, it you know, it may not be killing a lot of people, but there are some serious uh, effects when you get it. So I understand why players are opting out. I respect their decision. I will not criticize them for it. I think that is immature and stupid. It's something that I will not take part in, but I've seen it on Twitter, and I'm going to nip that right in the butt. Uh, But let's talk about the individual players that have opted out, starting with Rashad Bateman. Bateman. Um, He was like, or is likely going to be a first rounder, had a a very nice year at Minnesota last year. Um, 
you know, I'm not surprised that he opted out. Uh, but um, one guy that I thought would opt out was Jamar Chase out of LSU because they lost Joe Burrow. His stock was sky high after his year last year. Um, and I thought, you know, they lost Joe Burrow. His numbers probably aren't going to be as good as they were um, because the quarterback play won't be as good. Maybe he'll opt out and take advantage of how high his draft, his draft stock has gotten. Well, he's not opting out. Um, I respect that. Great, uh, great for him. Rashad Bateman, another receiver uh, decide, that has decided to opt out. Uh, Bateman, um, you know, he, I, I, I'm a little bit surprised because I think he could have improved this draft stock even more uh, because this quarterback is staying. Tanner Morgan is still at Minnesota. Um, you know, Tyler Johnson isn't there, so he was going to be the guy, even though he already was kind of the guy. He was going to be like, there's no competition. He is the number one receiver. He's going to get all the targets. So I'm a little bit surprised that he didn't opt out, but I do understand. Um, you know, he probably just doesn't want to have to deal with classes anymore. He wants to just train 24-7 to get into the NFL. I respect that. Another guy that opted out, Michael Parsons out of Penn State. I did want to see another year out of him, but he's a very good linebacker. I can't wait to get into his film, watch him. Um, see what I think about him. He's very good. Um, you know, Penn State was probably going to be on the bubble of making the playoffs, so I'm a little bit surprised that he opted out. Uh, but, you know, I understand why he would opt out. And just, you know, a lot of guys just don't want to deal with college. They don't want to have to, you know, deal with classes anymore. I don't know if, if that's the case, but if you get to go from, you know, being under control of the NCAA, having to do classes every day, to not doing any of that, and just training 24-7 to make it to the league, you know, it's kind of hard not to drop out of school and just train 24-7. It's hard not to make that choice. So I see why guys are doing that. Uh, one guy that I did expect to opt out was Gregory Rousseau. Miami is probably not going to be good this year, even though they did get the Eric King. I don't expect them to make much noise. Um, I mean, he, he could his stock could have rose even higher than it already was, but he's already widely regarded as a first-rounder this year. Um, Miami was going to be terrible. If he can just, just train and then show um, at the combine that, he, that he's worth a first-rounder and if his film's good enough, he's going to be a first-round pick. I get why he opted out. I, I expected that. Um, now, one... And one that I'm not, I don't think I'm really surprised that he opted out was Caleb Farley. Um, but he was the first one to announce that he was opting out. You know, Matt Miller, uh, who I don't know if he's with Bleacher Report anymore. I believe he is. Uh, he has his own podcast. He, um, he has Farley as his number one corner. I haven't watched any of the guys, so I don't have opinions on these players yet. Uh, but that's interesting. It's interesting to see that he has him above Sean Wade, uh, Patrick Sertain out of Alabama. Uh, so that's interesting. He He's the number one corner for Matt Miller. He opted out. Um, don't know what all he could have done for his stock. I'm, I'm not very informed on him as a player, so I won't, I won't say too much about him. But those are the four big names that have opted out of, of this year's college football season. It'll be interesting to see, interesting to see uh, how their draft stock is impacted and how their teams are impacted by their departures. It'll be really interesting to see how that develops. Now, today and yesterday, two big names that are opting into the season are Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence, uh, two of the best players in college football. They are playing this year. They have both announced they're coming back. So that's huge. That's amazing news. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but that's pretty much all I want to talk about regarding college football and the college football opt-outs. Let's talk about the NBA a little bit. Yesterday, we had some, some good games. Not great games. Not great matchups. But um, one of the best games of the day or yesterday was the Denver Nuggets versus the San Antonio Spurs. Um, we saw Michael Porter Jr. He went off in that game. Had his second straight 30-point. Uh, 30.10 rebound game. He was amazing. Dropping buckets. 
hitting threes, driving to the basket, getting shots around the rim, put a lot of pressure on the Spurs' defense, hitting shots. And it's great to see that because he has a ton of potential. He did deal with a back injury at Missouri in college, but he's coming back from that. Just seeing him drop 30 points consistently is great. I I hope he reaches his potential, and I hope he makes every team regret not taking him. Because he he fell out of the top 10. He was the 14th pick of the draft, Um, and it's just really good to see him play at a high level. Uh, But let's get back into the game. Spurs Nuggets. Nuggets won 132 to 126. This was a game of guard play for both sides. The Spurs, uh, man, their guards played well. Lonnie Walker only had nine points in the game, but early on he was super aggressive, attacking the basket, um, just generating rim pressure. He was great. MPJ started got hot early, hit hit some threes. The Nuggets got out to an 18 to six point lead early on in this game. But the Spurs did start to climb back. Mills hit a few shots, hit a few threes uh, to try to catch up. They made the score 18 to 13. Derek White came in the game. He made some noise. Rudy Gay played very, very well. Hit a couple shots off the dribble, one dribble pull ups. One of my favorite performances in the game, though, was from PJ Dozier. He was so, so good. And Jamal Murray didn't play this game, he hasn't played in the bubble. Um, so they're, they're relying heavily on Monte Morris, who's their, who's usually their backup. And P.J. PJ Dozier, um, who played at South Carolina, he was on the team that made that Final Four run. And he played very, very well yesterday. He had 12 points, 8 assists, and 5 rebounds. He was great in the pick and roll, making some nice bounce passes, drop-off passes in the pick and roll, making some passes across the court. Um, he was just really, really good as a pick-and-roll ball handler yesterday. Hit some nice shots off the dribble, pulling up from mid-range. It was great to see. Um, and, man, the, the star of the show, obviously, was Michael Porter Jr., uh, but another star for the Nuggets was Nikola Jokic. He was great. His passing was on full display yesterday. I mean, he was making beautiful passes throughout the game. He hit some threes. He was great. I mean, he had... 25 points, 11 assists, 4 rebounds, shot 10 for 17 from the field, 3 for 5 from from 3. He was absolutely fantastic. Another guy that had a big game for the Nuggets was Jeremy Grant. He had 22 points, 1 assist, 2 rebounds, shot 8 for 14 from the field, only 1 for 4 from 3, but he had a nice game as well. Monte Morris starting at point guard from the Nuggets. He was really, really good. At 19 points, 4 assists, 2 rebounds, 8 for 13 from the field, 1 for 4 from 3. Um, he was really, really good. Um, actually, I misspoke about Jeremy Grant. He shot 2 for 6 from 3, uh, which is a little bit better than 1 for 4. Uh, but yeah, the Nuggets, and you know, they, they were carried by Nikola Jokic and MPJ. They carried the scoring load a little bit. But Monte Morris played good, um, starting in place of Jamal Murray. The Spurs were really good as well. Um, their guard play was fantastic. They didn't get a lot of production from their bigs. Um, but, like, Derek White, he was amazing. 23 points, 7 assists, 3 rebounds, 6 for 15 from the field. Not great, but 4 for 10 from 3-point range. That's amazing. DeMar Rosen, he had 18 points, 8 assists, 5 rebounds. Rudy Gay, 24 points, 4 assists, 4 rebounds. Keldon Johnson... Came off the bench. It was really, really good. 20 points. 2 assists. 6 rebounds. Shot 7 for 10 from the field. 2 for 2 from 3-point range. He was really good. Uh, but the Spurs weren't able to get it done. Nuggets hit, uh, hit some big shots late in the game. Um, and the Spurs at one point, uh, you know, like in the early on in the game, they got down big a little bit. They climbed back. They got out to a lead. The Nuggets started hitting shots. Neither team was that good defensively in this game. Um, it was a, a very high-scoring game. Um, they were both hitting shots, attacking the rim, getting to the rim with ease. You know, both teams were really, really good at attacking the basket and then kicking the ball to shooters. Both teams had a lot of success doing that. Uh, but Nikola Jokic was awesome, and Michael Porter Jr. put the game away in the end. 
Um, great game to watch. Very exciting. There weren't there weren't a lot of other great games or exciting games. One game I do want to talk about: uh, the Jazz and the Grizzlies. The Grizzlies they're trying to secure the eighth seed in the West. It doesn't look like they're gonna do that because they are zero and four in the bubble or in the in the seeding games. They've struggled. Let me take a drink real quick. Gotta gotta get some uh, fluid. Ah, I'm sorry, my throat was starting to dry up a little bit. Uh, but like I said, the Grizzlies, they're trying to secure the 8th seed. Uh, they've struggled, haven't won a game in the bubble. They need this win. They needed it. Uh, and they played well early on. They got out to a lead. The Jazz were awful in the first quarter. Their offense had no creativity whatsoever. And that's been the case for a majority of these seeding games. The Jazz's offense has... Li- very little creativity. There's not a lot of movement. And it's leading to bad shots and just really bad offense overall. And the, it, the, and it happened once again in their first quarter in this game. Conley did have a really good start, though. He had seven points early on. Um, he was getting started. Memphis, they were going to need a lot out of John Morant, who did play well. Uh, they also needed a lot out of their bench guys, their secondary players. Brandon Clark had to start in place of uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. because he's out for the season with a meniscus tear. Uh, Brandon Clark, they needed him to play well. He didn't really. I mean, he was good defensively in the first half, only put up six points. But one guy that did play really, really well for them was Dylan Brooks and Grayson Allen. Both of those guys came to play. Grayson Allen has been amazing in the bubble. He's shooting very well from three. He's coming off the bench and providing some scoring and shooting um, off the bench. He's been great. He had 20 points in this game, I believe. Yeah, 20 points, one assist, two rebounds. He was great. Um, He was really, really good in the second half. Um, But like I said, in the first quarter, the Jazz's offense was not very good. Mitchell only took four shots. Uh, They were really uncreative offensively. Um, In the second quarter, they started to run some more creative sets, got more movement. The offense came to life a little bit. It was great to see. Um, There was one one thing I noted. Uh, There was an interesting lineup that the Memphis Grizzlies ran in the second quarter. They had Dylan Brooks, John Concher, I believe that's how you say it, Kyle Anderson, Brandon Clark, and Jonas Valanciunas. That is a pretty big lineup. You don't really have a true point guard because uh, John Morant was on the bench at this time. The one thing, though, I will say about this lineup, no spacing whatsoever. Not a lot of shooting. So there there just wasn't a lot of spacing. The paint was clogged. Uh, so I would recommend not running that lineup ever again. I don't really like... Just the lack of spacing hurts, the, hurts their offense uh, when they run this lineup. Uh, and Dylan Brooks, wow, was he amazing in the first half. He was incredible, hitting difficult shots, hitting shots off the dribble. His pull-up shooting in this game was pretty ridiculous. He was great. I think he had 20 points at halftime. He was great. Um, but the Jazz were on a huge run to, uh, to capture the lead before the half. They went to halftime with the lead. In the second half, Mitchell's passing was absolutely incredible. Donovan Mitchell was throwing some very, very incredible passing passes. Very impressive uh, cross-court passes. He, was dri- he just dribbled to the left on the pick and roll, and he would do a two-hand overhead pass to the right corner. It was incredible. Um, Ingles came alive in the second half, mainly in the fourth quarter. He had 25 points, scored 12 of those in the fourth quarter. He was amazing. Um, and Donovan Mitchell was great as well. But Joe Ingles hit some big shots late in that game to really seal the deal for the Jazz. The Grizzlies, it's going to be tough without Jaron Jackson Jr. John Morant played very well today, but he's been super inconsistent uh, in the bubble. I want to I want to take a look at the, the box score for this for this game. The Jazz got back on track. Uh, they've struggled a little bit uh, in the bubble, but they came back, had a very nice game. Donovan Mitchell had 18 points, six assists, seven rebounds. Joe Ingles was great, 25 points, five assists, four rebounds. Shot six for 11 from three. He was great. Mike Conley once again was really good. He's been playing pretty well in the bubble. 23 points, seven assists, five rebounds. 
uh, 6 for 13 from the field. Rudy Gobert was pretty good. Um, 21 points, 1 assist, 6 rebounds. Kind of low, uh, but he had 2 steals and 3 blocks. That's great. He was super productive on the defensive end. Then Royce O'Neal put up a decent stat line. 15 points, 1 assist, 4 rebounds. Uh, shot 4 for 8 from the field, 3 for 7 from 3. That's really good. Then Jordan Clarkson off the bench. He was solid. Had 14 points, 1 assist, 4 rebounds, 6 for 14 from the field. Once the Jazz's offense got into rhythm, got a little bit more motion involved, some more pick and rolls, the offense came to life and they were able to seal this game. Um, they got a, a lot of production from a lot of guys. A lot of guys contributed to this win for them, so that was huge. Um, but like I said, for the Grizzlies, Brooks was amazing, um, as was Grayson Allen. Allen had a huge game off the bench, but John Morant was really, really good. He he had some incredible passes in this game that were just awesome. Um, he hasn't been too consistent in the bubble, um, so he struggled a little bit. Had one of his better games yesterday. He was great. 20 points, 9 rebounds, 6 rebounds, shot 8 for 15 from the field, 2 for 3 from the 3-point line. I mean, he... His athleticism combined with his control, his footwork going to the basket, his, his fluidity, it's great. His passing is amazing, and it was on, on, on fire in this game. He was great, uh, but they did miss Jerry Jackson Jr. Brandon Clark wasn't that great. Um, offensively, he's going to have to carry more of the scoring load in place of Jackson Jr., um, but big win for the Jazz in this one. Tough loss for the Grizzlies. They're probably not gonna uh, not gonna secure the eighth seed. I expect the Spurs or the Trailblazers, maybe even the Phoenix Suns, because they're playing super well in the bubble. I expect one of those teams to to grab the eighth seed, um, especially with with JJJ out with uh, the torn meniscus. He won't be seeing the court for the rest of the season. Um, so keep your eye on that. Next up, I want to talk about the Lakers versus the Thunder. Um, wow, the Lakers look terrible in this game. They were absolutely awful in the first quarter. Their offense was terrible. They couldn't hit shots. Danny Green missed too many open open threes in uh, early on in the first quarter. The Lakers only scored 18 points um, in the first quarter. That's terrible. That's just awful. Uh, LeBron wasn't very good. AD wasn't very good in the first quarter. They just weren't very active. I want to see LeBron be more active, be more aggressive, attack the paint, shoot more from the perimeter. I just want to see LeBron get more involved. Now, if you just look at the box score, you'll say, hey, LeBron was pretty good. No, he really wasn't. Uh, the box score does not tell the whole story for this game. LeBron just wasn't aggressive enough. I want to see him attack the paint. I want to see him shoot more because he, he had a great year. This year, shooting from three. He became kind of a high-volume shooter. Um, and I just, I'm not seeing that from him in the bubble. I want to see that from him. Um, that was something that was missing from this game. And it hurt the Lakers' offense. Um, and OKC wasn't even that great in this game. They weren't. They missed a lot of shots as well. Um, I mean, their, their bench guys were horrible. They were missing easy shots at the rim. They weren't getting much from their bench. Dennis Schroeder didn't play in this game, so they were relying heavily on their starters. And in the first half, their starters just were not that good. Um, in the second half, it got a lot better for the Thunder. Chris Paul, he was great. He was just amazing in the pick and roll, hitting shots from mid-range, uh, pulling up off the dribble. He had this one play where he had Alex Caruso. Um, he used his hip to kind of keep him away from the ball. He, and then he used his little in and out to get into his spot, hit a step back mid-range jumper um, with Anthony Davis contesting it. That was incredible. Um, SGA, he was playing super well as a pick and roll ball handler in the first half. Um, and then one thing, a huge reason why the, why the Thunder were able to get a big lead in the second half was Danilo Gallinari waking up on offense. Uh, he was missing a lot of shots in the first half. Just wasn't that great. But in the second half, he was getting to the rim, hitting his threes. Um, and he was just, 
so much better offensively. And without Dennis Schroeder, he he needed to play very well offensively in this game. And he did in the second half. The Thunder got on a roll in the third quarter, and they got out to a huge lead. Um, I will say the Lakers, you cannot let teams drive on you like you did in this game. The Thunder, they were getting to the rim way too easily. You got to be more effectively effective offensively. Um, and that was a huge reason why the Thunder won 105 to 86. Uh, I'm starting to get a little bit worried about the Lakers. I'm going to be honest. I wasn't too high on them coming into the season. I had them ranked around sixth in the league uh, in my preseason in, in my preseason power rankings, which was too low. Um, that was really stupid by me. I should have known that with LeBron, with AD, they were going to be better than that. I was too harsh on them. That's my bad. I got to be better about that. I got to be better. Um, I would get better moving on. That, that was just short-sighted to me. Um, I should have realized with two of the top seven players in the NBA on, on one team, they were going to be more successful than I had than I had thought. Um, but I, the reason why I had them at six is because I questioned their depth and I questioned their, their shooting. Both of those are huge issues for the Lakers. Um, I think I talked about this on the last pod. If Danny Green isn't hitting his shots, who is? Like, I, I need that answer because Young Waiters, he's been okay. I mean, he, 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 he's been okay statist- statistically. Hasn't been consistent enough from three. J.R. Smith hasn't played that well. You're just not getting a lot of three-point shooting if Danny Green isn't on. And he wasn't on in this game. And when you combine that with Anthony Davis and LeBron James not being aggressive, not being on fire, um, which they like, like they were in this game, they're going to struggle. LeBron James and Anthony Davis, they have to just be incredible night in and night out in the playoffs to win the title. If they're not, they're not going to they're not going to win the title. They have no chance. Um, LeBron James is, is one of the best players in the world. I think Kawhi is, but it's so close. I think LeBron's second. It's super close. You can convince me one way or the other. There's not a lot of guys I trust in this league more than LeBron James. When the lights are the brightest, there's just there, there's not a lot of guys I trust more than LeBron James. He's going to give you a, a ton of effort. He's going to he's unstoppable when he attacks the the rim. He's become such an improved shooter. He's a great passer. He's playing a- incredible defense in the bubble. But he's got to be aggressive night in and night out. He's got to attack the rim. He's got to shoot more from the perimeter. He's got to make up for his teammates' shortcomings. And he looks a little bit rusty. I'm not too worried about him. I think he'll play well in the playoffs. Uh, but if he's not going to play well, Anthony Davis has to carry the scoring load. He did it in this game, and, and that's why they lost. They just Their offense was terrible. They were missing too many easy opportunities. They turned the ball over way too much. They struggled. Um, their stars struggled. That's why they lost, lost in this game. Even though OKC wasn't great offensively in the first half, and Steven Adams got hurt, they got to be better. I'm not like panicking yet about the Lakers, but I am a little bit worried. Um, there's some issues with this team that are real, that are big. Um, I would just say, hey, keep your keep your eye on this. Um, if they do continue to struggle uh, with their perimeter shooting, if their bench guys aren't going to provide a lot of offense, they're probably not going to win the title. I don't think they're going to win the title anyway. Uh, but if they continue to play like they are, I don't really see them um, winning the championship this year. And they may not make it to the conference finals. That's going to be it for this podcast. I hope y'all enjoyed it. I had fun. Uh, It's been great having basketball back. It's been great having live sports. Love doing this podcast. Hope y'all enjoyed. And I will see y'all next time. Peace.